Uh, I'm Mark Storsley. I'm the executive director of the Constitutional Law Center. I want to uh, welcome all of you tonight for being with us uh, as we talk about a really important and sort of cutting edge constitutional law topic, uh, which is how the sort of new shape of the judiciary under President Trump uh, impacts a really particular issue, uh, the administrative, administrative law and sort of the administrative state. This is kind of a controversy that I think, at least in my own sort of passive following of it, has sort of bubbled under the surface for a long time. Judges have different views about various canons within the administrative state and various fundamental parts of it. Uh, and now we're seeing sort of growing sense in which those disagreements are becoming more and more open and sort of more and more divisive, I would say. So um, we have, we could not ask for a better guide to this topic uh, tonight. Uh, Dan Rodriguez, is a professor at Northwestern at the Pritzker School of Law. He was actually dean of the law school at Northwestern uh, from 2012 to 2018. Uh, Dan is a nationally known expert in administrative law as well as statutory interpretation, various other topics. He's published zillions of books and articles that I won't bore you with all the names and titles of, um, but he is just absolutely uh, the person that uh, any media outlet, anybody would call and ask if they wanted to know about this topic. So we are very uh, grateful to have him here with us. He's visiting a Stanford this uh, quarter, and I think he'll be at Harvard later in the year. Is that right? So uh, please join me in welcoming Dan Rodriguez. So because we got started a little bit later, I'm going to get right to it and cut out all, all, all my jokes. Let me just stipulate they were really funny, and there was a lot of anecdotes, and I can talk about my many years as dean, all of which would be uninteresting. I do want to I do want to thank Mark, and uh, and also in absentia, Judge now Professor McConnell. I'm a uh, of long been a great admirer of all the wonderful. Uh, initiatives of the Stanford Constitutional Law Center. I had the opportunity to, to come to your last event. I, I must be a bit of a letdown <laughs> after that, but, but to uh, the Judge Starr event. But, but in any event, I'll take it. I'm happy to, happy to, to be here and talk about a topic. I, I, I don't want to uh, start out by quarreling with Mark's description about it being a little under the radar screen. I would say that you should see my Twitter feed. I mean, at least among us administrative law nerds, there was uh, before uh, shall we say, events overtook the matter, uh, an enormous amount of attention to, uh, to issues involving uh, uh, Judge, now Justice Kavanaugh, and to a lesser extent, Judge, now Justice uh, Gorsuch, uh, about their approach to the administrative state and, and all of that. And hopefully we can talk about that uh, as, we, as we get into it. So, so that, that's the topic. It's not, it's not a narrow topic, but it's not also the topic of whatever their hopes, dreams, and plans are with respect to the judiciary. Certainly too soon to tell. Uh, I have the vantage point, again, Mark was way too kind with the introduction. There's any number of folks uh, who could, of course, talk about this topic. I come to it without any particular insight, intuition. There's no stories uh, like, yeah, I was out having a beer. Well, that's maybe not the best choice of words. I was out at a meeting at a conference with Judge Kavanaugh or uh, Gorsuch, and I can tell you what the truth is. I have uh, the vantage point of having read a lot, having looked at a lot of, uh, a lot of their writings, uh, certainly their opinions on the lower court in the case of Justice Gorsuch now a year on the Supreme Court, and also an intuition, and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A, an intuition born of, of, of knowing, how shall I put it, the generation, because uh, 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 I'm sort of of the same generation of those folks and how they came to understand uh, uh, administrative law. So Trump judges, mostly, not entirely, as we'll get to the end, but mostly focused on his two uh, appointees, to the United States uh, Supreme Court for rather obvious uh, reasons. So we start with the provocation, I suppose. Uh, I didn't make up the phrase. I wouldn't have made up the phrase. I don't agree with the phrase, but there it is, the deep administrative state, the, 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 the administrative state that, uh, that exists in the form of uh, bureaucracy. I say that not to ridicule it, but to really reveal something that is not only a profound narrative, and long a profound narrative in our public debate, but one that had an enormous salience, duh, during the presidential election. And so uh, Newt Gingrich, talking not in the olden days, but actually talking during the course of the uh, 2016 election. Of course it exists. The permanent state of massive bureaucracies that do whatever they want and set up deliberate leaks to attack the president. Steve Bannon, I'm a Leninist. Lenin wanted to destroy the state, that's my goal too. Want to bring everything crashing down, destroy all of 
today's establishment. It does appear that beginning in, with the inauguration in early 2017, that Trump and the Trump administration meant what they said, which is to say that they, uh, the, they in, in fact, undertook to uh, roll back various regulations and with it uh, go on and attack uh, to uh, many aspects of the administrative state. That was sort of one feature that, uh, that looms very large and important in the experience of the last couple of years, unprecedented to a great extent. Number two, the appointments uh, that he made in the cabinet and in key administrative agencies reflected individuals, not, not it, it, it always to the same degree, but were individuals that had, in their own experience, in their own background, their own philosophy, their own writings, indicated, if, even if they didn't use the, the phrase, the deep state, an, an animosity, a fear, a concern about the rate and scope of the American administrative state and American regulation. Scott Pruitt in the APA, sorry, in the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, had cut his teeth in Oklahoma, right, with respect to uh, environmental issues. Wheeler, who, uh, who heads up the uh, EPA following the end of Pruitt, is at least uh, uh, as vigorous in that. And many folks, environmentalists, certainly said when Pruitt was, uh, was uh, left the, the EPA, well, we shouldn't get that excited. Wheeler is equally conservative and a good deal smarter and less corrupt. <laughs> so, uh, so Secretary of Labor, Secretary of Energy, former governor of my former state, Rick Perry, I think he had energy as one of the, either one of the, the cabinet posts that he said he would eliminate, or that was the one he couldn't think of in the presidential debate. But now he is atop the the, uh, the Department of, of Energy and Interior, the FCC, the appointee to the chairship of the uh, of the FCC had, I don't want to say campaign because it's not an elective office, but it made quite clear uh, his uh, his uh, uh, animosity toward the net neutrality rule and other aspects. So, etc. I should put in the end of that. All of which is to say that the Trump administration campaigned on a platform of rolling back regulation and dealing with the encroaching uh, place of the administrative state. And there's every indication before we even get to judges that in the bureaucracy in the cabinet, in key posts, that he would carry out that particular will. Before I turn to the topic, I just want a, a very brief detour to the history. This is, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an important sense, not a new debate. We could make much of, I just did, make much of the historic uh, impact of the Trump uh, campaign and the Trump administration on the deep administrative state. But debates about the vitality, constitutionality, utility, the good, the bad, and the ugly about the bureaucracy go back to the beginning of the bureaucracy. So the first major federal uh, administrative agency, regulatory commission, was the Interstate Commerce Commission more than 100 years ago in the 1880s. And there was spirit, spirited deba de debate at the time of the creation of the ICC, as there was 20 years later when Congress created the Federal Trade Commission. And at around the same time, the Federal Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration, and certainly during the New Deal, right, where folks using a remarkably similar vernacular attacked the administrative state, unelected bureaucracy, these phrases that have become so hardwired in our administrative law and constitutional law jurisprudence that deal with the administrative state, the headless fourth branch of government, right, originate not with the Trump administration, they originate back in the 19th century and into the 20th century. They originate in the debates, the vigorous debates, about the scope of the, uh, of the New Deal. So what's old becomes new again in some, in some fundamental way and fundamental respect is one perspective on this debate, continuing debate over the deep administrative state. And if I can go ahead of my skis and say this, it will not end with the end of the Trump administration. We will continue to argue as constitutional lawyers, as, as ordinary American citizens, as folks with a stake in our government about, about how far the bureaucracy should go and to what extent can the administrative state be married with our constitutional system of government and separation of powers. But back to, back to, to uh, Trump and judges. The Trump judicial uh, agenda was manifest and important, and it was certainly not limited to the issues involving the administrative state, but they were prominent. It's important to say that this was not just a curlicue on the overall agenda of the administration. Trump, for his part, mostly, mostly through talking points, that's not unusual for a president, 
uh, 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 talked about wanting to appoint people who would follow the law, right, rather than make the law. It's also, by the way, something you heard in the talking points of the last president and the president before that and the president before that as well, right? It's a sh shibboleth, to, uh, perhaps, but it's what you have to say. But he dug deeper, and those who were critical parts of the administration dug deeper beyond, we just want judges who will interpret the law and not make the law, and they spoke about the connection between judicial appointments and the administrative state. And who were the they? Well, the they, they were a broad uh, a, a collection. But here are two key folks in this whole debate. Maybe, maybe the most important, save for the president himself. Don McGahn, White House counsel, described a coherent plan to pair the administration's deregulation orders with ju uh, judicial nominees who would carry out those tasks. To the best of my knowledge, looking back at the history of judicial appointments, particularly thinking about judicial appointments in such courts as the D.C. Circuit, which plays, as many of you know, an outsized role in terms of administrative law in the administrative state. I certainly haven't seen another instance in which White House counsel or somebody so deeply embedded in the White House has basically said, part of what we want out of our judges is judges who will not only put the imprimatur on regulatory rollbacks, but will see a key part of their agenda and objective to carry out the uh, the agenda of the administration with respect to public administration, the bureaucracy and regulation. And McGahn, for better or worse, like him or not, like the policies or not, was utterly transparent in saying those are the folks they would look to to appoint to the bench. You may or may not know who Mr. Leo is. It's Leonard Leo, and he's the head uh, the executive director of the federal side. Actually, that's not true. G. Mayer said, I, I forget his exact title, but it's sort of like, uh, doesn't much matter. He is, the, he is within the ambit of the federal society, the person who, I can say this neutrally, has had more uh, 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 impact from, uh, than anyone outside the official uh, chain of command of the administration in vetting judges, potential ju judicial nominees, Picking judges would be an exaggeration, but in vetting judges and evaluating judges and recommending judges to, to the Trump administration. So Leonard Leo talks about the next step in the national debate about the proper role of courts uh, is, uh, is to look long and hard at the administrative state. It's a huge, glaring issue. Very briefly, to say what is probably obvious but needs to be said. So I'll channel my inner, inner Tina Turner, see how many of you get that reference. What's judging got to do with it? Well, first, and maybe foremost, courts, certainly including the Supreme Court, get to decide what is within the scope of the constitutional authority of Congress, generally, but also, in particular, with respect to administrative regulation, as Congress properly authorized this or that agency to exercise delegated power. Those are finally decisions that are made by the judiciary. The scope, and relatedly, the scope of delegation to administrative agencies, both uh, which, is, which is simultaneously a matter of constitutional interpretation, what the Constitution permits or does not permit, but also ubiquitously a matter of statutory interpretation, figuring out what is truly within the scope of agency power. And, and again, relatedly, the whole, the whole uh, scope of judicial authority with respect to separation of powers. And to get a little bit in the weeds, and we'll get back in the weeds a little bit later in this presentation, the courts have an enormous role with respect to the review of administrative agency decisions. And here we do have to, to, to reiterate, that's not just the Supreme Court. Indeed, it's not even especially the Supreme Court. It is uh, primarily the lower federal courts who have the responsibility, the authority, and indeed the duty to review administrative agency decisions. But of course, in turn, the scope of the authority of the appellate courts are subject to the doctrine developed by the Supreme Court. Administrative law in one slide. Those of you who are in uh, uh, Professor O'Connell's administrative law course will uh, go back and say whether I successfully did this in one slide. Of course I did. That's why you get to have so many weeks on it. But here's my, here's my, here's my run out. What does administrative law mean? Because that's going to become important in our discussion of the administrative state. It includes this, at least this. Judicial review of congressional action, right? Just as I said previously, to, in order to, to evaluate whether and to what extent Congress has acted within the scope of its constitutional duty and authority. Okay, Article I of the Constitution, the legislative power of government. Article II, the executive power of government under the aegis of the president. And Article III, the power of the courts. All are implicated by the court's review of administrative agency decisions. 
but, uh, but it's when we get into the, to the actual realpolitik, in the weeds of, of administrative review, that we really, uh, we really see the scope and majesty of administrative law. So all agencies in the United States agency actions are subject to review by courts under either the Administrative Procedure Act, which dates back to 1946 and has actually remarkably been amended very little, or and or the organic statutes, the statutes that create the agencies, configure and in many instances limit the scope of agency authority. And without getting into too much detail, that can be more than one statute. So you say, what's the statute that deals with environmental law? Answer, a bunch of statutes, ranging from uh, statutes that deal with clean air, clean water, toxic substances, the National Environmental Policy Act, there are many. So it's not just, you know, if somebody comes, drops into your office and says, where do I look? to find out what the scope of authority is of agencies in America. Your answer, which will probably not be pleasing to them, is you look at a big stack of stuff to understand what those statutes are. The review by appellate courts of final agency decisions, the heart and soul of what we really mean by administrative law, includes the review of two kinds of decisions. Formal proceedings, whether proceedings are adjudications that lead to an order. Uh, uh, Stanford University is in charge with an unfair labor practice. The National Labor Relations Board adjudicates that claim and reaches a decision that, yes, they've committed an unfair labor practice. That is subject to review by a federal appellate court. But so, too, is a final agency decision that comes after rulemaking, as when the Environmental Protection Agency enacts a rule governing uh, uh, emissions of pollutants. That, too, is subject to judicial review by a federal court. And it also is, uh, uh, it is through informal proceedings and informal agency actions that are reviewed by uh, court. So I cheated, not all administrative law on one slide, but just to give you sort of an overall, overall, uh, overall picture. So SCOTUS and in the administrative state, some modern trends. And we're sort of, obviously, we're leading up to uh, the, Trump, uh, the Trump judges. So a few things, a few, a few uh, nuggets, a few uh, uh, kind of greatest hits. Reviewing courts. Uh, uh, again, typically appellate courts, have been instructed by the Supreme Court in a number of decisions, but the, most prominently in the State Farm decision in 1983, still very much good law, uh, uh, are instructed to give agency decisions a hard look, which in essence means make sure the agency decisions are well-reasoned. Make sure the agency decision is supported by adequate evidence. It's not just a rubber stamp. It's a responsibility of the appellate courts to make sure the agency has gone through not only its procedural paces, but it's come up with a decision that passes, uh, that passes muster. It doesn't mean the same decision that the court would have come up with if left to their own devices. It's not, as we say in the law biz, de novo. But it's still a scope of review that requires the agency to engage in rational decision making. There is a strong presumption of reviewability of agency actions. And that is to say, Congress can, if it speaks very plainly and very exactly, preclude judicial review of administrative agency action. But number one, they seldom do that. And number two, there is an enormous thumb on the scale, the Supreme Court has said, is given to review of administrative agency actions, which says for all intents and purposes, all administrative agency actions are subject to judicial review. Broad delegations of legislative power are OK. We know that ever really since the New Deal, and even before that. So long as there are, so saith the Supreme Court, intelligible principles that guide administrative agency action. That is the quid pro quo, as it were, for upholding, under the Constitution, the delegation of legislative power. And then there is, expected to be, deference to administrative agencies' interpretations of their statutes, something called the Chevron Doctrine, which we'll turn to uh, uh, in just a moment. But I, I'm as anxious as you are to finally get to Gorsuch and, uh, and Kavanaugh. So I want to I move Could this along. Um, yeah, please. The word intelligibility is on my business card. So please forgive me. What is the court's definition of intelligence? Oh, oh if I could answer that. If I could answer that. I, I really, I, I, I can't be anything other than evasive and cynical. We don't know truly. We know it when we see it. The court did not define what is truly an intelligible principle. I'll say this less glibly. It is the kind of principle that is intended to guide administrative discretion so an agency could properly say, this is within the scope of the power that we have, and this is without the scope of the power we have. So have, the court having said there has to be intelligible principles and Congress needs to provide them, has by and large in our constitutional jurisprudence stayed the heck, heck out of further considering uh, what uh, is appropriately intelligible or not intelligible. If you're as cynical as I am in light of that, then, then we can start a club. <laughs>
Uh, separation of powers, formalism. Hey, I, I, anxious to get to this, so I'm going to skip over that. There's a, let, let me summarize this slide. A lot of neat stuff going on in the Supreme Court over the last 20 or 30 years in the area of separation of powers, okay, and in the area of, i got to say a couple things about it. Uh, Morrison versus Olson, very important case, 1988. That's Theodore Olson, Ted Olson, the independent counsel. Morrison versus uh, Olson was a seminal case because the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Independent Counsel Act, which has since gone out of business. But the, so, the sine qua non of the Independent Counsel Act was independence, which means the president could, couldn't go around firing the independent counsel except for cause. Okay? The Supreme Court said that's okay, notwithstanding the fact that the court had said in, in major blockbuster cases, if you're exercising executive authority, you have to be subject to the unilateral removal power of the president. That's what it means to uh, have a congressional statute that complies with Article II. So Morrison was a very big deal. Scalia, Justice, the late Justice Scalia was in dissent in an eight to one decision. And Elena Kagan, Justice Elena Kagan said as recently as three years ago, that was the greatest dissent. It's, it's like fine wine, only improved with age. But, but, but Morrison was, was a key case. That, that's a bad slide. I meant to fill that in. I, I, I really, I, I apologize for that. I did that at the last minute. So just pretend you didn't see the part after after uh, after Justice Antonin Scalia. May he rest in peace. So he passes away unexpectedly in what is it February around there in the in the early part of the spring in 2016, a number of months before the election. And while that is not our topic for today, you will recall that President Obama nominates fairly soon thereafter a successor. He is and still remains the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit, United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, Merrick Garland, but nothing happens. So Justice Scalia passes, uh, Merrick Garland is stalled, and it, it, uh, that seat, as it were, is left to President Trump to nominate, and he does that soon after he takes office, uh, Neil Gorsuch from the United States Court of Appeals from the Tenth Circuit, which is an aside is the court in which the great director of the Stanford Constitutional Law Center, Mike McConnell, sat, as he did with Ju uh, Judge Gorsuch for a number of years. So he's on the 10th Circuit. I think he was out of Denver. Harvard Law graduate, Oxford, clerk for both uh, uh, Justice White and also Justice Kennedy, worked for a very uh, prominent boutique uh, a firm that does, at least when I was in law school, mostly telecom work. I'm sure it's broadened its scope since then. And that's Kellogg Huber, where he's an associate and then later a partner. I just couldn't resist this. In 2002 op-ed on the Roberts and Garland holdups, he said, the most impressive judicial nominees are being grossly mistreated by the Senate. Ironic, isn't it? Uh, he issues over 200 opinions during his time on the, uh, on the Tenth Circuit. Without characterizing all of them, in a nutshell, I would say that probably the, the ones he's most well known for at the time he's nominated to the court are those that deal with issues of religious uh, 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 liberty. Justice Anthony Kennedy, maybe more expectedly, but none, uh, whether, whether expected or not, steps down from the court last, uh, 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 at the end of the term, uh, as, the, as the summer approaches, and Justice uh, President Trump nominates Brett Kavanaugh uh, from the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, where he had been since 2006. Both Gors Judges Gorsuch and Kavanaugh had long careers on the lower appellate courts, both having been nominated by uh, the second President Bush. Yale Law graduate, a clerk for uh, Justice Anthony, uh, 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 Anthony Kennedy. In the interest of disclosure, I'd say we both clerked for the same uh, 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 lower court appellate judge. Uh, he served in the Independent Counsel Office, actively involved uh, along with Judge Starr in the, uh, in the Whitewater et al. investigation. Uh, had a number of jobs in the Bush White House, and he too, like Judge Gor Gorsuch, being on the court for so long, authored 200 plus opinions, and was noted for having the Supreme Court, in cases that they took, adopting his reasoning, usually when he dissented from a decision of the DC Circuit, and only once not adopting his reasoning, in some key cases involving the administrative state. One point to emphasize here, and I alluded to it before, is yeah, they're both on appellate courts. You might say 10th Court, 10th uh, Circuit, DC Circuit. What does that matter other than location? In the area in which we're talking about here today, it matters a whole heck of a lot. The DC Circuit does the lion's share of administrative law cases. And so the, 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 the lion's share of the work that Judge Kavanaugh was involved in on the DC Circuit was precisely the kinds of issues that we're talking about uh, uh, now. 
here are some of the issues to just to, to pivot a bit before we come back to Gorsuch and, uh, and Kavanaugh. Here are some of the issues that are presently and profoundly before the courts, including the Supreme Court, not necessarily in one or another case before the court now, but the courts are, are, are federal courts are having to grapple with. Uh, some are, are perennial. So the scope of legislative delegation, as we talked about before. The question of the president's authority to appoint certain individuals. And the basic, in a nutshell, issue there is, are certain government uh, employees officers of the United States, quote, officers of the United States? If the answer is yes, they have to be appointed by the president or, or a head of an agency. If the answer is no, they can be hired through the civil service, they can be hired through whatever process whatsoever. Removal, the question that was at the heart of Morrison and many, many other cases going back to the beginning of the last century, which is the president's authority to remove executive officials. There are large issues of presidential power that we could talk about. There's the decision, the matters of judicial review of agency decisions. There's Chevron, which again, I promise to come to uh, because it looms so large in administrative law. And there are issues of statutory interpretation that are ubiquitous, that happen all the time since courts have to interpret statutes. Let me say a little bit more about the separation of powers uh, issues. Congressional creations in the shadow of separation of powers, that's a sort of an overly clever way to say statutes that are enacted. The question is whether they comply with separation of powers, delegation of authority, appointment of officers of the United States, removal of executive branch off, uh, uh, offices. What's the big deal? The big deal is the potential threats to all three of the key first articles of the Constitution. So the Article II concern, that is the, the Article II being the power of the president, the executive branch, is that Congress may, if, not, if left unchecked, encroach on executive power. That's a bad thing. There's an Article I and II concern, Article I dealing with legislative power and II dealing with executive power, about pot potentially agencies wielding too much power. And then there's occasionally an Article III concern, are agencies or administrative actions encroaching on the role of the courts. Skip over that. Perils of regulation. A lot of stuff involving regulation. The back and forth from the time of Reagan uh, to the present. Suffice to say that not until Trump is there an enormous effort to basically say, we're actually going to do something substantial about this. Limit regulation and roll back regulations that, uh, that exist. So what do we know about the, the Trump justices? We know some, but far from knowing all. This, this is what makes this, this experiment fun. We're reading the tea leaves, right? You can check it against what we'll know five years uh, uh, from now. We might say now, with the passing of Justice Scalia, we knew an enormous amount of Justice Scalia's approach to the administrative state, but knew precious little, not particularly more than we know about Kavanaugh. In fact, in many respects, far less, because Judge uh, Justice Scalia, before he was appointed, had been on the DC Circuit for not that long. He was appointed to the DC Circuit by President Reagan, and he was put up to the Supreme Court by President Reagan. So it's rare, it's rare in modern American history to have a judge that becomes a justice, this includes both Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, that have been on the lower appellate court for such a long period of time, uh, between the time they're nominated, uh, between the time they're on the lower court and the time they're on the Supreme Court. Now, with respect to Justice Gorsuch, again, it should be emphasized, he didn't have that much of an opportunity, I should say the Tenth Circuit, didn't have that much of an opportunity during the course of time he was there to deal with big blockbuster separation of powers. Things. That wasn't, again, by and large, the workload of that circuit. But every once in a while, a case came before him. And one of the, one of the interesting cases, uh, Burwell, you might recognize, King versus Burwell, of course, was the big uh, Affordable Care Act case. So Caring Hearts versus Burwell involved uh, an issue of Medicare. The number of formal, this, this is basically, you could read the quote itself. The gist of the quote, that he says more eloquently than I'm going to say right now, is that we should worry about administrative agencies. They're getting out of hand. Got to do something about them. Expansion of the administrative, doesn't use the phrase deep administrative state, but that's a cynical rendering, right? A critical rendering of the, of the, of the scope of the administrative state. So if you're, if you're, if you're saying, what does uh, uh, Judge Gorsuch say about administrative law and the administrative state from the time he's on the Tenth Circuit, at least this is some indication, doesn't think that highly of it. We don't know a lot from, uh, from Justice Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. Good Lord, he's been on the court for a term and a tiny little bit after that. And over the course of the last term of the Supreme Court, there weren't, by and large, an enormous number of blockbuster separation of powers cases or blockbuster administrative law cases. And again, as a junior justice, he, wasn't, he didn't have the opportunity, wasn't given the opportunity to author a number of those cases. Although, as you know, any justice is free to write a dissent or a concurring opinion. It's mostly through those, those tea leaves, concurring opinions, and who he joined 
that we know a little bit, a little bit, signal about how Justice Gorsuch will think about the administrative state. So one interesting uh, opinion was an opinion in a case, Sessions versus DiMaia, that involved the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, that essentially did a lot of things. It required the deportation of aliens convicted of a crime of violence. So a majority opinion written by Justice Kagan said crime of violence is too void. Sorry, it's too vague. So uh, it's too vague to meet the standards, appropriate constitutional standards, and we need to narrow it. So you don't see this very often, given what we expect lib quote, liberal justices will do and conservative justices will do. But there was an alliance of Kagan, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Gorsuch ruling, uh, uh, ruling that the Immigration Nationality Act uh, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, 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 illegal, unconstitutional. And Gorsuch went a step further and wrote a, uh, a fairly florid concurring opinion in which he signaled, I don't know about you, but to me signaled that he really worries about the delegation of legislative power. The problem is not just the fact of vagueness. The problem is when you have this vagueness, you, you delegate too much discretion, administrative discretion. He talks here about police and prosecutors, but you, you can imagine that could be the administrative state. George Will saw it that way and penned an op-ed saying, Gorsuch strikes a blow against the administrative state, solely based on his concurrence in DeMaia. Uh, we know a little bit more about uh, Justice Gorsuch. One uh, important separation of powers case that was decided last year involved Lucia versus SEC, in which the question was whether administrative law judges that essentially report to the Securities and Exchange Commission and are only evaluated for review by the SEC are or are not officers of the United States. Okay? The SEC's position was they were not, and thus there was no role to play either of the president or even the SEC because they were essentially civil service officers. The Supreme Court struck that down and held that they indeed are officers of the United States. And again, Justice Kagan wrote the majority opinion, and it was a narrow opinion. But Justice Thomas and Gorsuch wrote a separate concurring opinion that basically uh, would have taken a much broader approach and say any person in the government, I shouldn't have said any officer, any government employee who's exercising statutory authority that is exercising power under a statute is an officer of the United, uh, of, of, of the United States. So that put, brings in a whole swath of individuals as officers of the US. Oil States Energy Services versus Green's en 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 Energy Group would take too long to explain, but it's an example of a form of formalism. On this part, Gorsuch, uh, Justice Gorsuch, basically saying that patent disputes are private disputes, essentially private disputes. They're subject to what the court has called the private rights doctrine, which, and here's the kicker, means they have to be adjudicated by a court, an Article III court, meaning a judge appointed under Article III with lifetime tenure not an administrative, administrative agency. This is basically the two, I mean, it's not a lot of tea leaves here. Two opinions that suggest what? Gorsuch is a skeptic of the administrative state, is a formalist with respect to separation of powers, and is generally gonna align with conservatives uh, uh, on these kinds of issues. It's more interesting to talk about Judge Kavanaugh in this regard, because Judge Kavanaugh has been actively involved uh, based on his role in the D.C. Circuit and opinions he's written in debates about separation of powers. No more important than these two big uh, blockbuster uh, separation of powers cases. Free Enterprise versus Public Count Company Accounting Oversight Board was decided by the D.C. Circuit in 2008. D.C. Circuit upheld the appointment. It was basically a dual appointment process. The, removal, the restriction on removal of, of members of the board for cause had to go through two levels of the agency that the argument was disempowered the president from exercising authority to remove executive agency officials and thus ran afoul of the Supreme Court's precedent in that area. Uh, Kavanaugh dissented. In the past, when faced with novel creations of this sort, the Supreme Court has looked down the slippery slope and has ordinarily refused to take even a few steps down the hill. Two years later, the Supreme Court overturns the DC Circuit and essentially adopts whole cloth, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh's rationale and reasoning in the free enterprise uh, case. PHH Corporation versus Consumer Financial Protection uh, uh, Bureau. Very important decision. This is the, the bureau created uh, essentially by Senator Elizabeth Warren. And it's created and was staffed by Richard Cordray, who was defeated last, yesterday as uh, governor of, uh, of uh, Ohio. Maybe he should have stayed in the, in the bureau. I guess he could not because he was canned by President Trump. Uh, but I digress. So the, there was an en on banc decision of the DC Circuit upholding that arrangement under, uh, under that statute. 
Judge Kavanaugh wrote a 73-page opinion, dissenting from the uh, en banc decision of the DC Circuit. Extraordinarily far-reaching decision, he obviously didn't prevail, that, uh, that uh, essentially speaks for itself, violation of separation of powers. So we know certain things about Judge Kavanaugh. We know he is a formalist with respect to separation of powers, very concerned with encroachments on Article II presidential authority. He said that in opinions, he said that in other writings. Uh, prepared to overturn, prepared to overturn, I would suggest, Supreme Court precedents that have limited the scope of, uh, of executive uh, uh, authority and has been willing to write passionately and I would suggest eloquently, which is not the same thing as saying I agree with, uh, with all of his reasons or his outcomes, but passionately and eloquently on behalf of a very strong, robust approach to separation of, uh, of uh, powers. Someone who evaluated Judge Kavanaugh uh, uh, during the course of the, of the Supreme Court nomination proceedings said, uh, uh, as to his views of presidential power, Judge Kavanaugh helped pioneer a maximalist theory of presidential power associated with the notion of a unitary executive. By the way, I didn't put this on the slide because I got rushed. But one thing that's interesting that he, that he wrote in an article that was mentioned in the confirmation hearings in the Minnesota Law Review a number of years ago. He took issue with the Supreme Court's decision in Clinton versus Jones, that's the Paula Jones case, in which the court held that you could, in fact, charge uh, the president and go through the proceedings of a president in a civil dispute, civil dispute, during the time in which the president was in office. Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh, in writing this article, said not only did he think that was problematic, but even an investigation of criminal wrongdoing while the president is, office, uh, is in office is a bad idea. Not a decision that, uh, not an issue that the court reached in, in Jones. And if you may recall, having listened to the confirmation hearings, he got attacked and he got a lot of critical questioning about that, uh, about that uh, question, given obviously how it bears on the current investigation. Of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the president. American Constitution Society has made its view about Judge Kavanaugh's presidential power views. Uh, I, I'm going to just say a couple sentences about hard look review. This is really in the weeds. But for you if, uh, administrative law aficionados out here, here's the question I'll try to answer. What do we think that Judge Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch would think about the, the, the depths and breadths of searching judicial review of administrative agency action? Maybe three, broadly speaking, possibilities. Number one is, absolutely, administrative agencies should be reviewed in a very searching way. A view that's come to be endorsed as much, if not more, by conservatives as by liberals, for, for a variety of reasons. The second approach could be, you know, nothing that's particularly remarkable. That is, these are matters of administrative law. There's no particular reason to think that they're going to say anything particularly creative or meaningful about that. And the third possibility is that they'll, they'll flip around and, be, and view the federal courts as being particularly not intrusive, not very intrusive, which, by the way, was Justice Scalia's position, by and large. Administrative agencies should, I mean, the, the federal courts should, by and large, take a mostly, not entirely, mostly hands-off approach to reviewing administrative agency, uh, agency decisions. There's some reasons to believe, and this is why I quote this from a DC Circuit case that uh, Judge Kavanaugh, uh, opinion that he authored, is that, uh, is that uh, he might follow the third approach that he might be right smack in line with Justice Scalia and view that largely the problem has been overarching federal court review of administrative agency decisions. The reason why that's interesting, the reason why I put it out there is, that's not going to thrill the Trump administration. Because the more judges, if you think about it, the more judges that are on the court that are appointed by conservative presidents, that all things being equal, those presidents will want their judges to engage in searching review of administrative agencies. So if you take a hands-off approach, that might actually be, in some sense, regarded, fairly or unfairly, as biting the hand that feeds you. Finally, at long last, we come to an issue that's gotten some enormous attention in, uh, uh, during the confirmation hearings of both Gorsuch and, uh, and, uh, and Kavanaugh. Chevron versus NRDC, in a nutshell, is a case, Supreme Court case from 1984, in which the court unanimously said, that when con uh, said this. When Congress has spoken plainly about a particular issue in statutory interpretation, the agency is obliged to follow it. Duh, right? Because Congress gets to decide, not the agency. However, here's the key point about Chevron. Where Congress has not spoken plainly, the obligation of the reviewing court is to, de is to de defer, is to defer the administrative agency interpretation so long it's reasonable, as it is reasonable. 
Or to put it another way, the court takes a step back and says, we're not going to interpret the statute at that part. Where there's ambiguity, we'll let the agency resolve that ambiguity with its best interpretation of the statute. The court largely agreed with Chevron over the years. It became a major, major decision. Justice Scalia was a strong fan, a devotee of Chevron. There was, it didn't split usually along conservative or liberal lines until fairly recently. Gorsuch was a strong a critic of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 Chevron deference. He said that. You read Gutierrez, Brazella versus Lynch. Managed to live with the Administrative of State before Chevron. We could do it again. Uh, 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 very little would change, except perhaps the most important things. Uh, uh, members of, uh, of the Senate asked him, did you really mean that during the course of the confirmation hearings? You're darn right I meant it. Didn't say that exactly that day. What about the separation of powers? I thought judges were supposed to say what the law is. So that was very interesting. That suggested conservatives now start to not like Chevron. They see, they see the deference to administrative agency interpretations as empowering the administrative state, as pro pro uh, propelling administrative agencies to exercise discretion rather than judges. And that appears to also be Judge Kavanaugh's position, albeit in a somewhat more nuanced way. Has no basis, he says, in the Administrative Procedure Act. An atextual invention by courts, nothing more than a judicially orchestrated shift of power from Congress to the executive branch. I put in the bottom there, channeling Mike McConnell, because, uh, because uh, McConnell makes this very interesting point in, uh, specifically about Chevron and Kavanaugh, in which he essentially says, look, be careful what you wish for. If uh, these administrative agencies are appointed by the President of the United States, the President appoints these agencies. And whether Trump's around for four years or eight years, he's in fact going to appoint the head of a number of agencies. By contrast, the judges who are reviewing agency decisions in all the circuits, particularly the DC Circuit, are largely in the hands of judges who are appointed by Democratic presidents. So if you erode and get rid of Chevron, you're essentially, uh, uh, and, and, and make the courts be the determinators of what the statutes mean. You are not giving effect to presidential power, and that is something that uh, that uh, that the Trump administration is uh, likely to not like that much. Again, this is just to, to gild the lily a little, a little bit and suggest that uh, that uh, 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 Kavanaugh means what he says, and in fact is willing to basically say not only uh, might Chevron be a decision that ought to be overturned. But more to the point, it is, uh, it is uh, it's something that should be uh, defanged. I'm going to uh, get to the end because I've gone on too long. Is it about law or ideology to finally cut to the chase? Should we think about uh, the appointments of Justices Gorsuch and, and Kavanaugh as reflecting an ideological withering away of the administrative state or something different? Here's what's on the conservatives' wish list. That is to say, here's how they would judge the success of the appointment of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh or any other judges uh, who, uh, who, uh, who Trump appoints. Overturn Morrison and Humphrey's executor, thereby allowing the president to have complete control over agency officials. Displace the civil service with political appointees. Overturn Chevron. Resuscitate the non-delegation doctrine and require lower courts to aggressively review expansions of regulations and defer to, regula uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to agencies. I want to suggest it's more complicated. Again, the point that McConnell raises, separation of powers formalism uh, will generally mean an expansion of executive power that's neutral as to the president. So you're going to uh, get a strong bump up for President Trump, but you're also going to get a strong bump up of Beto O'Rourke or Kamala Harris uh, uh, during the next, uh, during, uh, uh, after 2020. How's that for a provocation? Uh, uh, a narrow scope of review means, a narrow scope of review uh, 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 means, uh, will affect rollbacks as, as well as regulation. And who guards the guardians? How do we think about the review of lower courts uh, in, light of what, uh, in light of what the Supreme Court is doing? Anybody know who these folks are? These handsome two individuals? Jimmy Robbins is the one on the right. Yeah, so these are the, the one, the person on the left is Greg Katzis, who actually has been appointed and confirmed to the DC Circuit. And the other is Naomi Rao, who currently, and she was deputy, and he was deputy attorney general to, to the president. She uh, is the head of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, a hardcore deregulator. I'll say at least that. If she were sitting right here, I don't think she would disagree with that. She has been interviewed now by the president for possible appointment to the DC Circuit. DC Circuit's in a weird place. There's only three folks on the entire DC Circuit, there are 11 judges, who are appointed by Republican presidents. All the Reagan appointees were, uh, uh, retired. So you've got, it's a very, if you, if you believe that ideology is measured by the president who appoints him, it's a very left-wing uh, circuit, hugely. Headed up by Merrick Garland, 
again, seven uh, uh, judges appointed by Democratic presidents. Obama got a lot of appointments. But starting steadily, it's, it's starting to make, uh, to make an increase. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll stop here. Yes. Uh -oh. Should I ask the microphone? Yeah, I'll take it. Microphone and turn it on uh, so that we can hear you and capture it on film. And uh, if you're a student that you have questions, definitely do come down uh, and we'll give you first priority. Okay. Thank you for taking my earlier question. I've got two more. Uh, I'm sure on everybody's mind is the question of Trump family finances. And uh, it seems like there's two uh, areas of investigation or two uh, areas of the government that might be investigating those. The state attorneys general before the new Congress convenes, apparently has have a RICO, uh, at least one RICO suit is uh, pending among them. And will they have better luck or worse luck, do you think, than the House Oversight Committee? And um, should Bernie Sanders and the Social Democrats run on packing the Supreme Court? Uh, two interesting questions. I'll take, a, I'll take a stab at answering both a very, very, uh, a very a few number of words. If, if I understand the first one, Yes, uh, uh, there are significant efforts to investigate and go beyond investigating the president. I, I can only speculate, but it strikes me that the concern, that the reason why they might hit a roadblock with the Supreme Court, and certainly with Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, reflect, uh, leaving aside whether they hit a roadblock because they, they owe a fidelity or oath of loyalty to the president, whatever. I have no opinion about that. I, I, I choose not to believe that which doesn't mean it's not true, but it just means I choose not to believe that. So consider them as judges. Number one is there would, we haven't talked at all in this presentation about statutory interpretation. Both of them take a very textualist view of how statutes are interpreted. So if somebody is going to investigate, seriously investigate, interrogate the president, they better have a strong statutory basis, that is to say federal statutory basis to do that, or they're gonna hit a big block among the conservatives on the Supreme Court, number one. And number two is, they're, both of these, these judges, and Kavanaugh in particular, are strong fans of presidential power. And it, taking Kavanaugh on his own words about what he said about wanting to leave the president alone during the period of time in which they're president and free from investigation, taken, taken to that to the next step, that would suggest that he would have a rather deaf ear with respect to efforts to, to sort of continue to interrogate and, and investigate and maybe even prosecute. The president, and I don't think, by the way, it matters whether it's the state, uh, the state, a state action or a federal action. The issue of packing the court is really interesting, and, and it got a lot of salience, of course, after the uh, after the election of Trump. And I don't know as I would uh, opine about whether it's a mistake or not a mistake. I think it's probably a non-starter. The notion that you're going to get cobbled together a coalition within Congress, right? Not to not to mention efforts to amend the Constitution, but just talk about Congress to do what has become popular: either pack the court or have term limits on justices, I think would have to go through a number of political, political checks that would be pretty hard to, pretty hard to, uh, to implement. Thank you, and excuse me, I have to leave Sure, sure, thanks for coming. Uh, so I was wondering what you would, how you would respond to people who say, well, elections have consequences. This is a conservative president. They're gonna nominate conservative justices. I think a lot of people would argue that Kavanaugh and uh, Gorsuch are probably justices that would be nominated by a lot of Republican presidents, maybe Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or what have you. So to what extent is the threats to the administrative state Trumpian, and to what extent is it just a conservative president doing conservative things? I think I, I, I uh, believe, uh, from a normative vantage point, what you said as a prior, that is what you said at the beginning, I believe that elections have consequences, and I tend to, for whatever it's worth, take a fairly narrow view, much more narrow than many of my colleagues on the right and on the left, on the role of the Senate. And, and it, bracketing, the, bracketing matters with respect to Kavanaugh in particular, which, that hasn't been the subject of this conversation, bracketing that, I think just that someone is very, very conservative, it's not a reason to, to appoint them. So I, I said, uh, that doesn't make me, it's not particularly courageous to say, I thought that Garland should have been, been uh, confirmed by the, by the Senate. It's a shame that he wasn't. And there was no reason to believe that uh, a reason why a very conservative judge should not be confirmed, given given the elections. But to your to your positive, your descriptive point, I think that's right. I don't think that if Rubio was elected to Jeb Bush, it would have been shocking to see Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, or any number of the folks who were on Trump's list on, on their list. And I go a step further. The next president, let's suppose the next president's a Republican, whether that happens in 2020 or 2024. <laughs> Other than uh, a number of judges aging out 
I think you'll see essentially the same kinds of judges on the list and maybe even some of the same names. So one of the other areas of uh, some concern uh, for is remedies for violations of administrative action. Uh, and so there's a lot of talk now about whether nationwide injunctions uh, have significant Article Three problems. Do you think that Gorsuch and uh, Kavanaugh would be kind of amenable to the Thomas view that nationwide injunctions should not be permissible, or do you think they would be a little bit more skewing towards Chief Justice Roberts? I actually think, very interesting question, and I, I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't bring it up. Uh, uh, I think they would be more amenable to the Justice Thomas approach. And I think they would be more amenable to the Thomas approach because although I didn't mention it here, both Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, maybe even more Gorsuch than Kavanaugh, are very strong devotees to originalist constitutional interpretation. Now no one is as much a devotee as Justice Thomas. But I think they are on that spectrum. And indeed, I didn't mention this, but in the DeMaio case that I, that I, that I refer to, uh, that in which just, Justice Gorsuch joined Justice Thomas, he basically said, I'm an original public meaning conservative. That, that's how I believe the Constitution could be interpreted. And the literature that I read on that topic, nationwide injunctions and all of that, suggests that an originalist, plain, you know, originalist public meaning conservative is probably going to side with a more narrow sense of judicial remedies in that respect. So that would be my guess. Now, whether they can cobble together five votes for that is, different, is a different matter. Yeah. yeah. Just looking at the questions that you've sort of got yeah. up there, as a current admin law student, uh, all of them are sort of basketed as open questions, except for the revival of the non-delegation doctrine, which, at least in my experience, is being taught as uh, don't bring up non-delegation concerns on the exam. Yeah. Do you see that as as in play uh, with the new court as the others, or are you just putting up there? Here's the Rodriguez O'Connell uh, dif uh, disagreement. I wouldn't ascribe it to anyone in particular. Yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> I would. I just because I just was talking to her about this at length yesterday because because we love these topics. I actually think it's dead and buried. I, I, I sort of subscribe to the view, I won't comment about what you should say on an exam, but I think the last delegation, the last case in which the Supreme Court struck down a statute on delegation grounds was in the 1930s. So when the court has had an occasion to do it, and they've had a case before them, the sentencing guidelines in Mistretta, uh, American Trucking, whatever, they basically said we don't get involved in that. Professor O'Connell uh, uh, has convinced me that well, there are new kinds of uh, regulatory strategies that Congress are doing, particularly in the area of delegating authority to private entities, which if you, if you go back to the 1930s cases was what the court in Car the Carter Cole decision said was not okay. So she says not so fast. It may actually be that the kinds of delegations that Congress is anxious to do will call anew on the court to look at these issues in a different way. I I'm not convinced, so I I I I'm with you. I think on this basket of issues, all of these are open questions. The least open question is the, uh, is the uh, revival of, of non-delegation doctrine. And by the way, the most open and potentially important question is the first. Because that could, I mean, you overturn Chevron, that could be a big yawn. But, uh, but you, get, you start monkeying around with the removal authority and all that, you're, make, you're making major inroads into the administrative state. Is there a, I don't quite understand the, the argument, I mean, the presidentialists you have listed there who also seem to be obsessing, at least on the Chevron front, about getting power back to Congress. So how do they, what's the, the, the reconciliation of a strong presidentialism position on the one hand, but trying to empower Congress on the other? So I've been noodling around with, noodling around with this theory to see if I can convince anyone uh, uh, of this. But, uh, so I'll see if I can convince anybody in this room. I actually think that you know, you've got the usual line of conservatives and liberals that drive a lot of these decisions and a lot of the predictions about what courts will do in a lot of areas, including the administrative state. And I don't, I don't really quarrel with that. You've got this interesting, just, I'll just mention in passing, uh, constitutional originalist that goes to that point that really is interesting, where Roberts, not so much, Alito, not so much, Thomas Gorsuch, and maybe Kavanaugh, hardcore originalists in the kind of Scalia, Thomas tradition. Uh, 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 Justice Kagan not only wrote a famous, famous uh, uh, law review article uh, uh, on presidential administration, administrative state, but has also authored some opinions that suggest, despite the fact she was uh, 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 appointed by President Obama, believes that administrative agencies, that the remedy, the solution for administrative agency discretion is broad presidential power. As long as the president controls administrative agencies, we shouldn't worry about broad administrative discretion, we shouldn't worry about delegation, any of those kinds of issues. So I could, I could fathom and see instances in which Congress restricting the power of the president, particularly as an overreaction to Trump, right, runs afoul 
of not only the conservatives' view, uh, you know, separation of powers formalism, but also of Justice Kagan's view that you have to you have to be careful when you limit the president, whoever the president is, because when you limit the power of the president, you basically defang the political branches from exercising much control over uh, over administrative agencies. I, I, I should, because I know we're out of time, I should just say as a footnote that that doesn't come just from her legal scholarship. Uh, uh, Justice Kagan has said this in, in a variety of uh, contexts. She uh, cut her teeth as an as a, as a administrative lawyer in the Clinton administration, had a very strong role in the administrative state in that, in that particular context. So we're talking about Trump judges and ideology and all that stuff, but sometimes these alliances and these lineups are not just liberal and conservative. When it comes to the administrative state, they, they can reconfigure because of folks who are more fans of Congress, which I tend to be, more fans of the president, or more fans of administrative agency discretion outside the scope of Congress and the president on the theory that why the heck do we have agencies if not to exercise expertise? There's that famous quote from, that goes back to the progressive era in which someone said, there's no democratic or republican way to pay the street. <laughs> kind of rocks your world when you think about it. So, that, so there's a different alliances that, that, often, that often come uh, a split on uh, on conservative uh, uh, a split from outside of the scope of conservative and and liberal liberal lines. Also, no Democratic or Republican way to thank Dan Rodriguez. So, just please, everyone, joining me in thanking you.